All of us can be very happy that we are here on this occasion. On this final day of the Divine Will International Assembly of Jehovah's Witnesses, we have come together with our hearts full of hope, although our minds are fixed on a serious question that affects all of us here and the billions of humanity around the globe. The speaker to whom we want to listen has set before him a grand theme and a terrific question. Can he prove the assertion that his highly advertised subject makes concerning rulership? Can he answer the question convincingly, authoritatively? Will we, as a result, understand better what is really taking place on earth and how it can result in a blessed outcome for all of us? We can be confident that the answers to these questions will prove satisfying. For our announced speaker will talk to us on the basis of the highest authority in full accord with authentic history. A noted Bible educator and also a global traveler, our speaker, Mr. Nathan H. Knorr, has been president of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society for 16 and a half years. Against this background of study, observation, and experience, Mr. Knorr will forthwith address us eager listeners on the announced subject, God's Kingdom Rules. Is the world's end near? Mr. Knorr, we now give our undivided attention to you. Only the best government in the universe is good enough for this earth. That is the way that the earth creator feels about it. For this, all men of good will can be glad. We can be thankful that the creator does not ignore his creation, even though this earth is so tiny in comparison with the universe. We can be happy that he respects this tiny creation as the work of his own hands and desires to dignify it with the best form of rulership. He wants it to reflect credit to him just the same as all the rest of the universe does. The heavens are declaring the glory of God and the work of his hands the expanse is telling. Quoted from Psalm 19. It is evident that government of the earth by man has not been the best form of rulership. Today we have the accumulated results of man's government of the earth and its inhabitants and those results are not good. We cannot lightly dismiss the matter. We cannot excuse the results by saying that man's government has been better than no government at all. The fact remains that government of the earth by man has resulted in a terribly divided world, and the race of mankind faces self-destruction by the inhuman weapons of its own manufacture. Government of the earth by man may have produced today a United Nations of 82 members, but it has not produced a united mankind, a loving, peaceful brotherhood of all races, colors, languages, and families. Not only has it failed to do away with death from merely natural causes, but it speeds up for all humankind a possible sudden violent destruction by man's own political military governments, not to speak of an Armageddon of destruction by man's creator. Nothing is more evident, nothing is more undeniable than that government of the earth by man and by the many gods of man has failed. In view of the glaring failure, it is time for man to draw some conclusion 
and decide upon the wise course of action. If political rulers refuse to take the right lead or set it for the people, then the people must individually do so for themselves. The political rulers lay plans and make arrangements to carry on their national governments into the unlimited future. They are not convinced of man's failure, but are stubbornly making further efforts to make a success of it and to show to the universe what they can do. They prove that they do not know or care to know, or do they have any faith in the purpose of the Creator concerning his own earth. They have faith only in themselves. They thus betray that they have learned nothing from man's recorded history. They are proud. They have not learned the wisdom and the rightness of the inspired advice of long ago. Do not put your trust in nobles, nor in the son of earthling man, to whom no salvation belongs. His spirit goes out, he goes back to his ground. In that day, his thoughts do perish. Psalm 146. Unless first a third world war overtakes them, all the rulers of this critical day will go the way of all previous political nobles and rulers. They will all breathe out their last breath. Their lifeless bodies will go back to the ground. Their misused power of thought will perish with them, and mankind will be no better off for their failure in attempts at government. Therefore, what each one of us has to decide is whether we will let ourselves go on suffering just because of the foredoomed efforts of mortal man to govern. When we make a personal decision to avoid suffering the final disastrous consequences of government by human rulers, it does not mean we will stir ourselves up to revolt against them or will we start a revolution or become anarchists? Carrying out a peaceful or a violent revolution would mean we would merely substitute the government by other men with a government by ourselves. The end result would be not different. It would still be government by men, by ourselves. The communistic system of government, which started with a violent revolution and seizure of political power, is an example of this. However, if we turn away from government of the earth by man, even by ourselves, to whom then can we turn for good government that will not be a failure? There is only one to whom to turn for successful rulership, and that is the earth's creator man's creator, that is, to God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the opening words of the Holy Bible of sacred scripture read. Turn to God, the creator, for earth government? Is that practical? Most certainly. Just as much so, as our turning to man for government of the earth has proved impractical by the results that man has reaped today. Letting God govern his earth according to his divine way is not only most practical, but the most reasonable because it is the most beneficial, lastingly beneficial. This is all the more true now for God's kingdom now rules. It has already begun to reign over our earth. All who want to enjoy endless life in peace, health and happiness must bow to it willingly. That is the practical result of turning to God for our government. Since when has God's kingdom begun to rule? 
more than 600 years before the Christian era, the prophet Jeremiah said, Jehovah is in truth God. He is the living God and the king to time indefinite. Jeremiah 10.10 10. Yes, the true God, whose name is Jehovah, has always been king. He has always been in control. He has always governed. He is the sovereign of the universe. And none of his creatures has been able to overturn his sovereign rule, not even the devil. Yet for almost 6,000 years now, very few men have acknowledged him as king and desired his kingdom. Even when his time came for his kingdom to rule this earth directly, mankind almost as a whole gave no welcome to a government by him. They have yielded no sovereignty to his kingdom. They have rendered no allegiance and loyalty to his kingdom. Nationalism rules. The man who acknowledged most the kingship of Jehovah God and desired most his heavenly kingdom to govern this earth was Jesus Christ. 1900 years ago, he was the one that taught his disciples to pray to the king of heaven, our father in the heavens, let your name be sanctified, let your kingdom come. Let your will come to pass as in heaven, also upon the earth. The very fact that Jesus taught his disciples to pray for the heavenly Father's kingdom to come proves that the kingdom has not, there was not then governing the earth. The Roman Empire, not God's kingdom, was then dominating the inhabited earth. Every informed person knows that it was the Roman governor at Jerusalem who, at the instance of the religious leaders of Jerusalem, had Jesus put to death on a torture stake outside of the city walls. Yes, indeed, Rome of the Caesars was then governing as a world power. God's kingdom was not then ruling. It had yet to come in answer to the prayer that Jesus taught. The question was, when was God's kingdom to begin to rule? The religious clergy of Christendom have long taught that God's kingdom came when the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great claimed to become a Christian and when he took religious bishops of the popular Christianity of that day into the government service. They have taught further that God's kingdom would come and rule through governmental politicians as these became Christians subject to the religious clergy. When finally all the politicians in power became Christians and all the human governments became Christians, then God's kingdom would fully become. Thus God's kingdom would not be a direct government from heaven but this teaching of the religious clergy of Christendom is false. It has served the clergy well as an excuse for meddling in the politics of this world. Any attempt to establish the kingdom of God by means of the politicians of this world must fail. It is an attempt to make messiahs, Christs, out of politicians of this world. This is most obnoxious to Earth's creator, for it is rejecting his own kingdom. More than 25 centuries ago, God the Creator furnished all mankind the proof that his kingdom would not come through human governments or through politicians of this world. In the 12th century before Christ, the Israelite chiefs, like most men of today, thought that it was impractical to have the God of heaven rule them directly as a nation. God had delivered them from slavery in the land of Egypt and had located them in a land of milk and honey in the Middle East. 
he had given them the most remarkable set of laws known to man. Through the prophet Moses, he had given them the Ten Commandments, together with hundreds of other laws. He had proved to them that he was God Almighty and that his name is Jehovah. The first of his Ten Commandments to them declared, I am Jehovah your God, who have brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slaves. You must never have any other gods against my face. He built them up into a nation. He brought them into a solemn contract or a covenant with him to be their God of blessing and to have them as his people. He was their invisible king. However, those Israelites lost faith. They cultivated the desire to have a visible human king like all the non-Jewish nations around them. So they came to Jehovah's prophet Samuel and said, Now do appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. 1 Samuel 8, 5. That request for a human ruler was no light thing. It was not the expression of democracy that deserves to be recognized and complied with. It was a rejection of God as king, and he told them so. The Bible record says, Then Jehovah said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people as respects all that they say to you. For it is not you whom they have rejected, but it is I whom they have rejected from being king over them. For this, Jehovah did not reject them at once and throw them away as his people. He granted them their desired kind of king because he mercifully held fast to the covenant that he had made with them. Did that kingdom prove practical? Did that Israelite government of human kings succeed? Why do not the Israelis of today have as much land in the Middle East as their forefathers had in Samuel's day? Why do not they not have a God-given human king over them? We merely have to go to the sacred Hebrew scriptures to learn the answer, which the Israelis themselves cannot contradict. They have no human king today because the experiment of their worldly wise forefathers with a human king failed and failed disastrously. It failed in spite of the fact that God anointed as king over them the faithful shepherd David of Bethlehem and established a dynasty or line of rulers in David's family. It failed in spite of the fact that those kings of the house of David reigned at the city of Jerusalem where God had chosen to put his name Jehovah. And those kings sat on the throne, called the throne of Jehovah, and reigned as his visible representatives. That Israelite experiment with human kings failed, despite the fact that the entire Jewish nation and its king were in a special covenant with Jehovah their God and had his own laws and his prophets. God mercifully allowed them a little more than 500 years to experiment with their human king who sat on the so-called throne of Jehovah at Jerusalem. Finally, God himself, who had yielded to their asking for a human king, became so provoked with the nation and their royal government that he overturned the government in the year 607 before Christ. This was done by the armies of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Seventy years later, Jehovah brought a faithful remnant back from their exile in the distant land of Babylon, but his throne was not set up again at Jerusalem. To this very day, 
It has not been set up there. It never will be set up there again. What then about God's kingdom that Jesus Christ preached and that he taught his disciples to pray for? In the light of the Jewish experiment, is there any historical reason, not to speak of Bible prophecy, for believing and teaching that God's kingdom will come through the politicians of Christendom together with the help of the Pope of the Vatican City and the religious clergy of Protestantism? No! Can we reasonably think for one moment that the all-wise God who foreknows all his works from long ago has launched out on another experiment like that with the Jewish nation? No! God's own word answers no. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, answers no. But Christendom's politicians, instructed and supported by the clergy, Catholic and Protestant, have decided that that is the way God's kingdom should come and rule. So they have proceeded to govern on the theory of the divine right of kings or on the theory that as the higher powers ordained of God, they represent God to every soul, and all souls must be subject to them. Yet, they sit on no throne of Jehovah. From the days of Emperor Constantine the Great till now, the rulers of Christendom have had over 1,600 years or more than three times as much time as the Israelite kings had. But have they had more success than the Jewish kingdom had with its capital at Jerusalem, the holy city? Besides having more time than the kings of the house of David, they have had more than the mere Jews' religion. They have had the complete Holy Bible and its teachings of Christianity as a greater aid. Yet, with all this advantage, have they succeeded? Through Christendom's clergy-backed politicians, is God's kingdom nearer now than it was in the days of Emperor Constantine? Is God's kingdom ruling today by the kings, presidents, and governors of Christendom? No. Since 1914, two world wars have been started right in the heart of Christendom. And the whole system of things throughout the world is in a worsening state of disorder. The ungodly communist giant has risen up. By this year, he has gained control of one-third of the earth with a population of 944,900,000. Desperately, Christendom fights to check the giant, not only from making further inroads into Christendom, but also from swallowing up the non-Christian neutral nations of the world. Because of claiming to be Christian and to be in a new covenant with God through Christ, Christendom has had greater opportunities and heavier responsibilities. So in failing, Christendom is more reprehensible before Jehovah God than the ancient kingdom of Judah that was in the old law covenant through Moses. One big thing, counting heavily against Christendom, is its part in the United Nations now in its 13th year. The international organization established in 1945 to guarantee world peace and security. When the United Nations started functioning in January of 1946, the physical properties of the dead League of Nations were turned over to the UN as its successor. Back in January of 1918, in the very throes of World War I, the American president, Woodrow Wilson, proposed the League of Nations. The very next month, Jehovah's Witnesses, as represented by the president of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, began preaching the startling message, the world has ended. Millions now living will never die. 
Early in the following month, prominent witnesses of Jehovah ga began to be arrested in America for preaching God's kingdom as the one and only hope for all mankind. And in the course of the month, the sentencing of them to long imprisonment followed. The issue was then plainly before the American churches of Christendom, God's kingdom, or the League of Nations, which should professing Christendom choose? World War I ended with victory for the democratic allies. But with the foremost witnesses of Jehovah in prison. The Paris Peace Conference was due to begin in January of 1919. The leading churches of Christendom in America declared their choice, but they confused the issue in order to make a compromise. On December 12, 1918, the Executive Committee of the Federal Council of Churches of Christ in America held their annual meeting and endorsed President Wilson's plan for a League of Nations with a declaration that contained the following remarkable statements. I quote, The war crisis of the world has passed, but a world crisis is upon us. The time has come to organize the world for truth and right justice and humanity. To this end, as Christians, we urge the establishment of the League of Free Nations at the coming Peace Conference. Such a League is not a mere political expedient. It is rather the political expression of the Kingdom of God on Earth. The heroic dead will have died in vain unless out of victory shall come a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. The church has much to give and much to gain. It can give a powerful sanction by imparting to the new international order something of the prophetic glory of the kingdom of God. The church can give a spirit of goodwill without which no League of Nations can endure. The League of Nations is rooted in the gospel. Like the gospel, its object is peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Like the gospel, its appeal is universal. We call upon all Christians and upon all believers in God and lovers of men to work and pray with whole souls that out of the ashes of the old civilization may rise the fair outlines of a new world based on the Christ ideal of justice, cooperation, brotherhood, and service. End of the quotation. A special commission made up of the president of the Federal Council and other representative leaders of the churches was appointed to convey that declaration to the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. This special commission of churchmen is on record as having presented this declaration to officials of the government in Paris, France. Next in May 1919, the said Federal Council of Churches passed a resolution pledging their support in securing ratification of the League of Nations by the American Senate and pledged their devotion to make the League of Nations a success. Later, an American organization that advocated the League of Nations came out with the slogan, quote, in a world dark as this, why blow out the only light there is, end of quote. But in 1939, the Nazi leader, Adolf Hitler, blew out the only light, and the League of Nations disappeared in the abysmal darkness of World War II. The efforts of all the churches of Christendom to make the League of Nations a success had failed. Their prayers for it 
had gone unanswered from heaven. What the Church's Federal Council called the political expression of the Kingdom of God on earth had failed and the heroic dead of World War I had died in vain because out of the military victory that they had helped to win, a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness had not come forth. What then is there to say honestly about the actions and attitude of the churches of Christendom toward the League of Nations? This, the Holy Bible denounces those religious organizations as guilty of blaspheming and as setting up the idolatry of a vain scheme through associating God's kingdom with the League of Nations. They grossly deceived all mankind by advocating an abominable counterfeit for God's true kingdom, and they brought great reproach upon the Most High God. Thank God, however, that the kingdom of God did not fail with the League of Nations. Though the League of Nations died, though the League of Nations died in eternal death, God's kingdom has continued to rule. From 1920 onward, Jehovah's Witnesses exposed the League of Nations as being the abomination of desolation, foretold by Jehovah's prophet Daniel and mentioned by Jesus Christ in his prophecy on the end of the world. You can read this in Daniel the 11th chapter, the 12th chapter, and Matthew the 24th chapter. Jehovah's Witnesses dissociated the League of Nations from God's kingdom and declared that the League would fail. They devoted themselves to carrying out Jesus' prophetic command this good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the inhabited earth for the purpose of a witness to all the nations. That kingdom has no political expression on earth, not even in the United Nations of today. Let Christendom's churches, Catholics, and Protestant cooperate now with the United Nations as much as they will and let them pray for its success in staving off a third world war. The United Nations will no more have success, it will no more have the blessing and cooperation of God's kingdom than its predecessor did, the blasphemous, abominable League of Nations. Little do the people of the world appreciate that all these things are historical evidence that God's kingdom rules and has been ruling since the autumn of the year 1914. Toward the climax of World War I, a number of well-known British clergymen came out in print on what they understood the happenings in the world to mean. By a dramatic event in the Middle East, they had their attention drawn to these words of Jesus' prophecy concerning the world's end. Quoting now from Luke, the 21st chapter. There shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. On December 9, 1917, British General Allenby captured old Jerusalem from the Turks. Then these clergymen met in London and issued a manifesto which was published in the press of that capital of the British Empire. The press report said, Quote, 
The following manifesto was recently issued by a number of England's most noted ministers. First, that the present crisis points for the close of the times of the Gentiles. Second, that the revelation of the Lord may be expected at any moment when he will be manifested as evidently as to his disciples on the evening of his resurrection. Third, that the completed church will be translated to be forever with the Lord. Fourth, that Israel will be restored to its own land in unbelief and be afterwards converted by the appearance of Christ on its behalf. Fifth, that all human schemes of reconstruction must be subsidiary to the second coming of our Lord because all nations will be subject to his rule. Sixth, that under the reign of Christ there will be a further great effusion of the Holy Spirit on all flesh. Seventh, that the truths embodied in this statement are of the most practical value in determining Christian character and action with reference to the pressing problems of the hour. End of the quotation from the manifesto. After publishing the names of the eight ministers of five religious denominations who signed the manifesto, the press report said, quote, These are well-known names and are among the world's greatest preachers, that these eminent men of different denominations should feel called upon to issue such a statement is of itself exceedingly significant. End of the quotation. The eight clergymen who signed the manifesto were disappointed as to what they expected. In other words, they proved to be false prophets. By the year 1926, they had come out in opposition to Jehovah's Witnesses, who were intensely publishing in all the inhabited earth the good news of God's kingdom that it now rules. The time of the Gentiles, mentioned in the foregoing manifesto, disappointed the minister's expectations by not ending some time after General Allenby's captured, and he had captured Jerusalem in 1917, and Britain received the mandate over Palestine from the League of Nations. Today, the Arabs possess old Jerusalem, and the Mohammedan mosque, known as the Dome of the Rock, occupies the location of the ancient temples built by Jehovah God. Why is this? It is because those times of the Gentiles concerning which Jesus Christ prophesied ended years before Jerusalem's capture by the Turks. They ended in 1914, in the year in which World War I burst upon the nations of Christendom, although those nations were bound together under the permanent tribunal of the international arbitration known as the Hague Court. The word Gentiles means literally nations. Jesus used the word to mean the non-Jewish nations because he said that Jerusalem, which was Jewish, would be trodden down by the Gentiles, that is, by the non-Jews. Consequently, the ending of those times of the Gentiles meant that something ended for the non-Jewish nations of the world, including the nations of Christendom. What? We can learn the answer by finding out what began for the non-Jewish nations when those times of the Gentiles began. For one thing, the Gentiles began trampling upon Jerusalem. That did not mean just the destruction of a city, the capital city of the Jews. It meant more. It meant the trampling upon the kingdom of Jehovah God. Ancient Jerusalem was the city where God has chosen to place his name. 
The temple built to him by wise King Solomon was there on Mount Moriah. Jehovah's visible representative, the king, anointed by his high priest, reigned at Jerusalem, and the king's throne was called the throne of Jehovah. The government of the nation of Israel, with its seat at Jerusalem, was a theocracy. It was a miniature earthly kingdom of God. Jesus Christ said that Jerusalem was the city of the great king. So the treading down of Jerusalem meant treading down God's kingdom. The treading down began at God's two times. The last king of the house of David to sit on the earthly throne of Jehovah at Jerusalem was King Zedekiah. About four years before Jerusalem was destroyed for the first time, the prophet Ezekiel was inspired to say to King Zedekiah, quote, O deadly wounded wicked one, the prince of Israel, whose day is come in the time of the iniquity of the end, thus saith the Lord Jehovah, remove the mitre and take off the crown. This shall be no more the same. Exalt that which is low, and abase that which is high, and I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. This also shall be no more, until he come, whose right it is, and I will give it to him. Ezekiel 21. In June of the year 607 before Christ, King Zedekiah was captured while fleeing from the Greek city of Jerusalem and King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon blinded him and took him captive to Babylon to die there in prison. The next month, July, the Gentile Babylonians looted Jerusalem and its temple of Jehovah and then destroyed the capital city and temple of that ancient typical kingdom of God. Two months later, the last of the few Jews remaining in the ravaged land of Judah fled in fear down to Egypt. And the land of Judah became desolate of man and domestic beasts. Thus, about October 1 of that year, 607 before Christ, the times of the Gentiles began. They began with the Gentiles or non-Jewish nations holding world domination through Babylon and no more having to bother with God's kingdom because Jehovah God himself had overthrown the kingdom. The reason was that the Jews had failed to appreciate it. Through the prophet Ezekiel, Jehovah said that the kingdom would be no more until the one should come who had the right to it, at which time Jehovah would give it to him. 1900 years ago, the Son of God from heaven became the man Jesus Christ on earth in the royal family line of King David. Jehovah God anointed Jesus with Holy Spirit to become the Christ. In this way, God made a covenant with Jesus Christ for the kingdom, an everlasting kingdom. Jesus always preached about this kingdom, but God did not give him the kingdom at that time. It was not God's will for Jesus to be a human king on earth at Jerusalem in the Middle East. It was God's will according to the prophecies that Jesus die and be resurrected from the dead and return to heaven and sit down at God's right hand to become king there. Four days before the Jewish Passover in A.D. 33, Jesus rode in triumph into Jerusalem. A multitude of Jews shouted, Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Blessed is the one coming as the king in Jehovah's name. Blessed is he that comes in Jehovah's name, even the king of Israel. But on Passover day, 
a different kind of crowd, led by Jewish priests, howl for Jesus' death, and the Roman soldiers nailed him to a stake to die. With the criminal charge posted over his head, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. On the third day of Jesus' death, Jehovah God raised him from the dead. Then out of the invisible spirit realm, the resurrected Jesus made appearances to his faithful disciples. Ten days before the coming festival of Pentecost, Jesus ascended out of their sight and returned to heaven and appeared before God with the life-saving value of his human sacrifice by his faithfulness to God's kingdom, even to an undeserved death, Jesus proved his right to the royal throne in God's kingdom. Yet, God did not give him the kingdom power at that time. It was not God's time. Less than two months prior to that, Jesus had given his prophecy concerning the end of this world. He had said that the times of the Gentiles already begun would run on and that God's kingdom as symbolized by earthly Jerusalem would continue to be trodden down by the Gentiles until their times to tread God's kingdom underfoot would end. What was then to happen to these Gentile enemies of God's kingdom? An inspired Bible writer tells us when he says concerning Jesus Christ, This man offered one sacrifice for sins perpetually and sat down at the right hand of God from then on, awaiting until his enemies should be made a stool for his feet. You can read that in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verses 12 and 13. So Jesus had to wait till the Gentile times ended. Those eight clergymen who signed the London Manifesto had no excuse for not knowing when the times of the Gentiles ended. Since 1877 in particular, Jehovah's Witnesses had widely published by books, booklets, magazines, and Bible tracts, as well as by word of mouth that God's marked time for the Gentile times to end was A.D. 1914, in the early autumn. Although a dream to Babylon's king through Nebuchadnezzar, who first destroyed Jerusalem, Jehovah God revealed that the times allotted by him to the Gentiles for treading down God's kingdom was seven times in number. Even of these times, or rather each of these times amounting to 360 solar years, the seven times were thus to run for seven times 360 solar years, or 2,520 solar years. Since those seven times began with the desolating of Jerusalem and the land of Judah in the early autumn of 607 before Christ, they ended in the early autumn, or about October 1 of the year 1914 of our 20th century. The whole world, including Christendom, is Gentile. So, what did the end of the times of the Gentiles, A.D. 1914, mean? It meant the end of their treading down, not that Jerusalem relic over in the Middle East, but it meant their treading down the kingdom of God. Then it had ended in 1914. In 607 before Christ, the start of the Gentile times meant down with the typical kingdom of God among the Jews, up with the Gentiles to divinely permitted world domination. In 1914, the end of the Gentile times meant just the reverse. It meant down with the Gentile treaders and up with the kingdom of God. It meant... 
It meant the birth of God's kingdom, not at old Jerusalem on earth, but up in heaven, where Jesus had sat waiting at God's right hand until the Gentile time ran out. Then Jehovah God gave Jesus Christ the active power of the kingdom because he had the right to it. Therefore, since A.D. 1914, Jehovah's Witnesses announced to all the world, God's kingdom rules. We do not ask you to accept the mere date 1914 as proof that God's kingdom rules. There is more to the matter than a mere date. We ask you to accept what came with that date and what therefore confirms that date. When prophesying, about the world's end, Jesus gave no date. He gave what may be more convincing than a date by which we could know that God's kingdom has begun to rule. Jesus foretold the world happenings and conditions. Three Bible writers give us separate accounts of what Jesus said. We quote from the Authorized Version, or the King James Version Bible, which was published in 1611, or about 350 years ago. Jesus had just predicted the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple by Romans, which was to occur in the year 70. So certain apostles came to him privately and asked him, and now I quote Jesus' words, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus said that down till the time of the world's end, there would be false Christs and wars and rumors of wars, just as in the past. But these would not spell the end. As he put it, but the end is not yet. Then to point out to us the evidence of the beginning of this world's time of the end, Jesus went on to say, Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrow. All these things concentrated together would mark the opening sorrows, the initial pangs of distress of the world's time of the end. The disciple, Luke's account says the same thing. Besides other details, Luke adds, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. And the power of the heavens shall be shaken. There is distress of nations with perplexity today in this nuclear missile space age with its communist menace and Sputnik as in no previous period of history. That needs no proof on our part. Everybody must admit it. But when did this period of distress of the nations begin? With this generation. World historians agree that it began with World War I. The world can never forget that the world of total mobilization of nations and kingdoms around the globe began in 1914. The other things that Jesus named as part of the beginning of sorrows follow, that is to say famine, pestilences, and earthquakes. Only last December 4th, 1957, 
there occurred what was called one of the history's greatest earthquakes in outer Mongolia. It struck the Gobi Atlas Mountains and moved mountains, diverted rivers, created new mountains and valleys, and opened up new water courses. Quotation from the newspaper of January 23rd, 1958. However, today all mankind is quaking because of world events and developments and the possibilities. This long series of world distressing events did not begin accidentally in 1914. It began in 1914 because the times of the Gentiles ran out that year. Its beginning in that year stamped 1914 as the year when the times of the Gentiles ended and the denial of this fact by all of Christendom's clergy cannot disprove it. World events from 1914 onward prove not only that Jesus Christ was a true prophet but that in 1914 he came into the kingdom power to which he had a right and that his presence in the heavenly kingdom began then. God's kingdom by his anointed king, Messiah, had been born. The Gentile nations, including Christendom, no longer held the world domination on earth. God's kingdom ruled. It dominated from that time forward. After Jesus foretold the beginning of world sorrows and the persecution and hatred against his true followers, it was therefore in the proper order of things that Jesus added as another visible evidence of the establishment of God's kingdom in the heavens in 1914, this feature. Quoting now from Matthew 24. And this good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the inhabited earth for the purpose of a witness to all the nations. And then the accomplished end will come. Is this good news of the established kingdom being preached as a witness to all the nations since 1914? If for an answer we look to the ministerial signers of the London Manifesto and to all the rest of the religious clergy of Christendom, the answer is no. But if for an answer we look to Jehovah's Witnesses who are today reporting their preaching in 170 lands and islands around the globe, the overwhelming answer is yes. <laughs> Since the close of World War I, fascism, Hitlerism, communism, World War II, and the Catholic and Protestant clergy of Christendom have proved unable to stop Jehovah's Witnesses in their preaching work. <laughs> Jesus Christ prophetically said that the kingdom good news would be preached after the end of the times of the Gentiles. Even so, this good news has been preached and is being preached now even though Christ, uh, Christendom's clergy are spiritually blind, deaf and dumb as to this sensational good news. The question now comes up for answer. Is the world's end near? The reply of Bible prophecy and world conditions is yes. <laughs> this world, including Christendom and God's kingdom, are not friends. They cannot mix Jesus Christ 
just before he was handed over for execution, said to the Roman governor, My kingdom is no part of this world. To his disciples he said, Because you are no part of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, on this account the world hates you. God's kingdom stands for his promised new order of righteousness. The Apostle Peter said to his fellow Christians, We, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. God's kingdom will bring in that new order that spells absolute annihilation for this old world. Looking to this day when the times of the Gentile domination without interfering from God's kingdom have passed, the prophet Daniel said, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, nor shall its sovereignty be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. That destruction by God's kingdom means Armageddon for this old world. Since the close of World War I in 1918, the Gentile nations, led by the God of this world, Satan the devil, have been on the march to Armageddon for their final showdown fight against God's kingdom. That means that by the year 1958, they have been on the march for 40 years, and neither the League of Nations nor the United Nations organization have halted their march or caused them to disarm towards God's kingdom. How much longer will the march go on before the war of the great day of God the Almighty begins? This generation of mankind is nearing its normal end. Jesus prophesied that this generation, which saw the Gentile times end the mid-world war one and the beginning of world sorrows, would also see the end of those sorrows in the world's destruction at Armageddon. Quoting from God's word, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things occur. Heaven and earth will pass away but my words will by no means pass away. We know not the day or the hour, but the world's end is near. The world's end. The world's end is nothing over which to be sorry. Should we be sorry because a new world, God's righteous new world of new heavens and a new earth, is to begin after this old world ends in Armageddon? Jesus instructed his faithful disciples to rejoice as they saw the evidence that the end of the old world of Satan, the devil, and the new world of God's kingdom being near. Let us free our minds of the religious lies of Christendom's clergy and the theoretical lies of the modern-day scientists that the end of this world means the end of this earth on which we live and the end of the sun and the moon and the stars which give us light from heaven. Jesus Christ taught his disciples to pray to their Father in heaven, let your kingdom come, let your will come to pass as in heaven also upon earth. God's kingdom comes not to destroy this earth, but to destroy Satan's world. God's kingdom comes not to burn up this earth, but to bring to pass God's will here on earth as well as it is in heaven. For that reason, the earth is worth preserving as God's creation 
and God will preserve it for all eternity as the home of redeemed, uplifted, perfected men of goodwill. The song of the angels at Jesus' human birth, glory in the heights above to God, and upon earth peace among men of goodwill will forever be true. Satan's world and its nations are opposed to God's will on earth or in any other part of the universe. Satan's world is his organization made up both of wicked demons in the invisible heavens and of the wicked men and nations of the visible earth. Hence, it is Satan's world with its ungodly system of things that must and will end be destroyed. The earth will survive the world's end. Men of goodwill on earth will also survive the world's end by the special protection of God's kingdom that is now ruling. <laughs> Jesus prophesied that it would be at this world's end as it was in the end of the ungodly world of Noah's day. The great flood from heaven wiped out that ancient world. But Noah and his family together with select birds and animals survived in the ark and started human life anew on the cleaned up earth. Though at Armageddon there may be more fire than the lightnings at the flood of Noah's day, yet men of goodwill are assured of surviving this wicked world's end and beginning life on earth in God's new world. Rejoice, you men of goodwill, for that means living under the best government of the universe, God's kingdom. In his new world, no matter where you live on earth, you will be under one theocratic government, God's kingdom, by Jesus Christ. That government will do for mankind what no political government of men during all of the times of the Gentiles has done. It will rid mankind of the interference of Satan's invisible demonic organization. It will also rid the earth of ungodly communism and of the clergy meddlers in politics and of everything contrary to the will of God. It will rid the earth of man's last enemy, death, the death that all of us inherited because of the original sin of our first father, Adam, by whom death entered into the world. Destruction of Adamic death will benefit not only the living survivors of Armageddon, but also all those of humankind who sleep in death in the memorial tombs. As regards the earthly survivors of the world's end, because of loyally obeying God's kingdom of Christ and his glorified faithful disciples, they will be freed from the condemnation of death inherited from Adam. They will be cured of all imperfections of body, mind, and heart, finally attaining to human perfection in God's image and likeness. As regards those humans sleeping in the memorial tombs or who lost their lives at sea, Jesus Christ the King will again exercise the power that he used when here on earth to raise the dead to life. He will fulfill his own promise and call the human dead forth to life on earth with all its blessed opportunities under God's kingdom. There is going to be a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous, says God's word. All those living on earth in the new world will be judged by the way they conduct themselves towards God, Jehovah and toward his king, Jesus Christ. His kingdom will make all the earth a delightful paradise. All men who pass the final judgment test with 
unswerving devotion and obedience to God and his kingdom will be rewarded with the right to life in human perfection in this earthly paradise forever. There they will always do the divine will. Oh, therefore, let all men of good will turn now to God for earth government. All hail to God's kingdom that now rules. May it bring the old world's end in his own appointed time and soon. May his kingdom usher in the everlasting new world to man's eternal salvation and to God's unfading glory by Jesus Christ. I know that many of you here this afternoon have questions in your mind as to some of the things that were stated. But Jehovah's Witnesses would be very happy to answer any question that is in your mind relative to the world's end, to the Gentile times ending, to the meaning of the things that are happening today and showing how these things are really fulfilling prophecy. And Jehovah's Witnesses would be very happy to call upon you at your home or at a place convenient at any time and explain further these very happifying things from God's Word. All you would need to do is just turn your name and address in to one of the ushers, write it on a piece of paper, or write to the Watchtower, Brooklyn, New York, and someone will come to see you within the next two weeks' time. We would like every one of the 253,922 persons here this afternoon We would like all of you to take with you a copy of this booklet published by the Watchtower Society. It's an exact reproduction of this lecture this afternoon that you have heard. God's kingdom rule is the world's end near. It's free to you, all of you. There are sufficient copies on hand, a half a million copies, in fact. You may take two copies from the ushers, one for yourself, one for your friend or neighbor. Read it with them, study it. All the scripture citations are here. Look it up in your own Bible. Believe me when I say that Jehovah's Witnesses are anxious to encourage home Bible study so that you may find the way to life in God's new world and help you to understand that now Jehovah's King's, uh, kingdom rules and that the end of the world is here. We must study our Bibles and find the way to eternal life. So please, all of you people of goodwill, study the Bible. Look into it carefully and get aid from Jehovah's Witnesses. And may Jehovah's rich blessing go with you.